ओके वेल थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर हैविंग मी एयर आई एम अदनान कुरैशी एंड आई एम एक्चुअली कमिंग फ्रॉम कोलंबिया मिजूरी एंड आई रियलाइज इन द प्रीवियस प्रेजेंटेशन डॉक्टर अलेक्जेंडर एक्चुअली शोड अ मैप एंड सिंस मोस्ट पीपल डोंट नो वेयर कोलंबिया आई प्रोबब्ली शुड हैव ब्रॉट अ मैप एज वेल सो आई एम एक्चुअली गोना गिव एक अपडेट ऑन एपिडूरल पोस्ट इनटॉलरेंस एंड टॉक अ लिटिल बिट अबाउट एपिडूरल इंटरवेंशंस सो व्हाट इज अपराइट पोस्चर इनटॉलरेंस in fact is the inability to stand upright without any difficulty now we all know of uh, upright posture intolerance being a cardinal feature of intracranial hypotension or acquired chiari however it can be seen in many conditions it can be seen in postural hypotension it can be seen in postural tachycardia it can be seen in various cerebellar and spinal ataxias it can also be just seen with age because the muscular reflexes are just not as robust and of course the vertebral brazer arterial ischemia and vestibular dysfunction being the other diseases now my interest in actually upright posture intolerance didn't start in the clinics it actually ended up starting in the zoo as i was visiting the zoo i was actually looking at a giraffe and i was just fascinated at how the giraffe can move its neck and head several feet in distances without actually having any symptoms so i did a little bit of more research about how giraffe can adapt to such postural changes and it appears the giraffe actually has veins that drain from the brain and these veins either have valves or act very high resistance vessel so it does allow blood to release or be relieved from the brain in a very controlled fashion so then the question is is this mechanism also exist in the human beings so to address that question we started doing what we call as upright cerebral angiography so we all know of cerebral angiography being performed in supine position however you can tilt the table to at least a certain degree and repeat the imaging to see if there is any change in the venous drainage in normal human beings and here you can actually see on the image on the left side is what the cerebral veins look like when the patient is at a supine and you can see the prominent contribution of the internal jugular veins now turn the patient into an upright position and you will notice that the role of internal jugular veins diminishes considerably and there is far more role that's played by the paravertebral or the ancillary veins in terms of drainage of blood flow from the brain and here is actually another image depicting the same concept that internal jugular veins and its potency is what we have been relying on to determine whether there is actually truly effective cerebral venous system drainage but in fact in the upright position that may not even matter much on top of it there is so many variants many people actually the internal jugular vein is not the main drainage system in fact they have supplemental venous systems and at least almost half of the patient there is supplemental veins that are draining blood from the brain in addition to the internal jugular vein and these supplemental veins are smaller higher resistant and perhaps more amenable to compression from the external muscles so there is clearly a large variation in the cerebral venous system and a postural related role that may be playing an important contribution in upright posture intolerance and perhaps the next series of intervention may not be epidural or surgical may actually be transvenous interventions now we were doing all these epidural interventions and clearly the patients always reported an improvement in their ability to tolerate an upright posture but we didn't really have a measure to at least quantitate to some extent what kind of response and the timing of response is so we developed a questionnaire um, a self administered questionnaire because perhaps the patients are the best judge of whether they do have tolerance or intolerance to upright posture uh, it actually tried to assess various components of upright posture and obviously ease of use and repeated feedback from the patients whether the item that we're inquiring are really pertinent was also an important feature in developing such a question So we identified four items you know one is how long can you stand straight without a support do you feel any sense of sickness when you sit back and lie down after standing straight with or without support so there is a hangover syndrome lot of people complain about how long do you have to wait before you feel comfortable in standing up again so there may actually be a component of just normalizing or actually normalizing confidence before the patient stands up again and again how fast can you achieve a position from supine to upright 
Can you actually just move in one step or do you need multiple steps and perhaps even support before you can change position from supine to upright position? Obviously, we had to give it some quantitative values so the patient actually is not making it, giving some strata so the accuracy or comparability is actually increased. So for the three questions, the first three questions were easy. You can give it strata of not at all, less than five minutes, five to 29 minutes or 30 minutes or greater. For the last strata or the last question, you could actually get up from supine position to upright position without any support, or you may actually have to do it in steps. And the worst strata would be that you actually need support from moving from supine position to upright position. And this is what the questionnaire would actually look like in practice. And another component of the questionnaire is that, as you know, that in a lot of recent studies, there have been more emphasis on the vertical visual analog scale. So essentially asking the patient to rate their ability to perform activities such as household chores while in standing position. So zero being that they cannot perform any of those activities and 100 being the best place they can perform all their activities without any difficulty. So this was actually a questionnaire developed. Next question was to test it. So we tested it prospectively. So there were six patients who had come in with intracranial hypotension and we were performing lumbar epidural blood patches for these patients. So we prospectively asked them these questions at baseline, immediately after procedure and at one month follow up. So the two questions that had the most consistent response in terms of improvement or how long can you stand straight without any support? And consistently people rated improvement in that particular parameter, all the patients reported improvement. The second question that showed the most consistent response was their ability to perform household activities when they're actually standing upright. And all the patients consistently support, uh, demonstrated an improvement on the visual analog scale in terms of that particular question. The responses were actually more mixed for the other three questions. So perhaps there is a greater level of subjectivity in interpretation of these questions. On the other interesting thing was that some of these patients had pre and post MRIs. So here you have a group of patients that are clearly reporting improvement in symptoms immediately after the procedure. But if you report or repeat the MRI immediately after the procedure, there's really no concurrent radiological change. So apparently in intracranial hypotension, perhaps the clinical improvement can occur without a clear radiological change. Now what about the role of epidural intervention in carry malformation that is not related to intracranial hypotension? So this is actually a patient with Marfan syndrome who actually had a carry malformation. The patient actually came in for epidural intervention but patient had hydrocephalus, patient also had perineural cyst. And these are not symptoms of intracranial hypotension. So the question was whether an epidural intervention really helped the patient or not. And the last thing we want is to make the patient's symptoms worse by actually increasing or the, in putting blood into the epidural space and limiting the CSF space. So we actually decided to do intracranial pressure monitoring before proceeding with an epidural intervention. And this is actually intracranial or cerebrospinal fluid pressure measurements using a lumbar catheter. And one thing you would notice is in general, this patient actually had high intracranial or high cerebrospinal fluid pressure during the recording. And the cerebrospinal fluid pressure increased dramatically when the patient actually stood up. And the best position and symptomatically the best position of the patient was when patient was in a fetal position, which means the head is actually below the body. And clearly you can see there is a dramatic decrease in the cerebrospinal fluid pressure in that particular position, concurrent with symptomatic relief. So now we have this syndrome, so how do we explain that? And I don't really have the clearest explanation, all I can give is a hypothesis, that perhaps the tonsillar descent in certain carry malformation patients is really postural dependent. So while they're in a supine posture, they have some tonsillar descent, as soon as they move into the upright position, there's a marked tonsillar descent, and essentially there's a plugging of the cerebrospinal fluid system, and that's why there's a dramatic change in intracranial cerebrospinal fluid pressure. And as the patient moves into the fetal position, some of this tonsillar descent is actually relieved by just position, 
And that's why the intracranial pressure dramatically reduces or normalizes, actually moves into an intracranial hypotension kind of syndrome. So we decided that if we can relieve this posture dependent tonsillar descent, perhaps the patient's syndrome can actually be improved. So we actually did a blood patch, um, which was not really truly just a blood patch. It actually did have fibrin sealant injected as well for sustainability. We decided to actually do it in the corded epidural space, so go through the sacral hiatus into the epidurum with the concept that perhaps that is a place we can get more of the blood and the fibrin sealant. And you can actually see an MRI on the left side, and as you can see the marked tonsillar descent before the procedure. You look at the MRI after the procedure, and you can see this clearly improvement in the tonsillar descent. And there's always a clinical improvement in the patient's symptoms. Now the question is that unlike intracranial hypotension, where the cerebrospinal leakage may be temporary, in carry malformation the defect still remains. So how long will the effect of an epidural injection last in these patients? So we actually followed this patient serially. And you can actually see the clinical syndrome, the symptoms. Uh, the columns in red mean the worst clinical syndromes, the one being the best clinical syndrome or symptoms, and yellow being partial response or partial relief of symptoms. And we also have current current MRIs. So we actually do have the ability to measure tonsillar descent serially over time. So after the first epidural blood patch, there is actually clearly radiological improvement but again, the clinical response is not sustained. And over five months, the patient's symptoms put us in a position that we have to repeat the epidural blood patch. This time, we didn't do it in the sacral hiatus. We actually did it in a classic lumbar epidural space. We injected a much larger amount of blood and sealing, or fibrin sealant. And you can see that there is a clinical and radiological response that actually is at least there for the first two months. And then after the first two months, there's still some persistent response. So it is not as optimal as seen immediately after the procedure or the first few months after the procedure, but the response does end up persisting for months after the procedure. If you look at upright tolerance and patient's own definition of how long the patient can stand upright and perform activities, there's a clear change. So there's a you know, patient before the procedure reported, she could only stand for like three minutes before she would actually have to sit down. And after that, patient actually reported that she could actually stand for 120 minutes. And it is actually concurrent with the radiological syndrome. So you can actually see the tonsillar herniation. As it improves, the clinical symptoms improve as well. But the other interesting thing is there is perhaps some level of sustainability with repeated epidural blood injections or fibrin injections. So perhaps repeated injections lead to fibrosis in the epidurum and change the compliance of the epidural space. So perhaps making the syndrome worse or less worse or less or the symptoms actually syndromic relief lasting for a longer period of time with repeated injections. Now the last thing I want to talk about is classically we've always done epidural interventions in the lumbar space. There has been increasing thought that perhaps lumbar space is not the right place for epidural injections. Well, part of it is if you look at patients with idiopathic intracranial hypotension, if you look at people who in whom you can actually define a place for cerebrospinal fluid leakage, a lot of these patients don't have the leakage in the lumbar space. They actually have leakage in the cervical and epid or thoracic epidural spaces. So the question becomes is that if the epidural injection was done somewhere between the cervical and thoracic junction, would you actually have a better response? So I'm actually going to show you a video of the epidural cervical epidural treatments. I'm just going to escape out of it. This is actually a procedure that we have recently adopted more and more frequently. This was actually somebody who actually had severe headaches, thought to be consistent with intracranial hypertension, had lumbar epidural press with no response. 
So the decision was made to actually try a cervical epidural pace, perhaps to give patient a better response and perhaps a more sustainable response. So here you can actually see the procedure. Uh, it's actually done awake. And usually it's done in the lower cervical space. And under fluoroscopic guidance, you can identify the interspace that you want to use for the epidural axis. And like any as procedure, uh, there is some local anesthetics that given that seems pretty rudimentary for this <laughs> group of physicians. Uh, but nonetheless, the space is actually prepared. So the goal is really to actually enter in an interspace uh, from the dorsal aspect all the way into the epidural. And then for cervical epidural injection, we actually use a smaller carable needle. So for lumbar, we usually use an 18 gauge needle. For cervical, we actually end up using a 20 gauge needle, so a smaller needle, um, just for our own level of comfort. <laughs> so it's a classic standard um, spinal needle. And it's actually um, filmed in real time, so it actually does tell you the amount of time it takes to do this procedure as well. So here the needle position is actually checked under fluoroscopy and the needle is subsequently advanced into the lower cervical compartments. So you can just see simply changing the angulation to make sure that we can enter the interspace uh, without actually interacting with the cervical vertebra or the spinous process. So the needle is actually advanced all the way to the ligament flamen, ligament of flamen in small increments. So we started doing them in lateral decubitus positions because we initially used to do it prone, but it was very hard to get the shoulders out of the way so we could actually visualize the interspace as well, particularly in the lower cervical region. So here you can see the uh, needle being advanced in small increments. And then essentially identifying the epidural space is pretty similar to any epidural space identification where loss of resistance is considered a marker of entry into the epidural space. So here you can see just small injections of air, uh, mainly actually to check whether there's still resistance so as soon as we will enter the epidural space, there will be a loss of resistance. So here you can see a contrast injection and you can see the epidural space has been lined up. The posterior epidural space with contrast, so we do know that we are in the epidural space. And then subsequently, blood is injected. Now when we started doing that, the question was how much blood should we inject? Because in the lumbar space, we're pretty comfortable injecting up to 30 cc's. But in the cervical epidural space, the question is we don't want to give so much blood that we're actually mimicking an epidural hematoma and actually a spinal cord compression. So, so far we've only injected at maximum up to 18 cc's and we haven't seen any neurological syndrome or any evidence of compression of spinal cord with this procedure at this point. So here you can see the layer of the a blood in the epidural space. You can see most of the blood is layered in the posterior component of the epidural space. So, you've done four procedures in a patient who actually had a failed response to lumbar epidural blood patch in the lumbar region. And we have monitored them carefully with an independent physician to document the response. So as you can see that on all these patients, uh, we have really used the lumbar or the, actually the cervical, lower cervical epidural space for the blood injection. All of the patients actually respond, report response, but the response has varied. Some people report complete resolution, some people report partial resolution.
The duration of response is also varied. But the most important thing is in terms of complications, the only complication we have seen is local pain. We haven't seen any epidural compression or any spinal cord compression, but at least the amount of blood that we're injecting in the cervical epidural space. The last thing I want to quickly highlight is that um, We've always used this term blood patch, but really it's not blood patch because most of them now are being changed to blood substitutes. In fact, there's more and more data coming in with platelet-rich plasma being used to actually inject in the epidural space uh, because one is sterile. So in certain patients who actually have meningitis and they get intracranial hypotension because of lumbar puncture to diagnose meningitis and you don't want to give their own blood to actually create an epidural abscess, so you can actually give platelet-rich plasma because none of the blood banks actually carry whole blood anymore. So you can actually get a combination of plasma and platelets and mix them. And in addition to it being sterile, it also has growth factors. So there may be some role in healing of the epidural space over time. And again, fibrin glue has been used for patients where a more sustained response is required. So essentially because unlike blood, it will not be hemolyzed. So it will actually remain a longer period of time but obviously you have to be aware that it will cause a lot of epidural fibrosis, which may have concerns in people who are getting repeated epidural injections because the epidural becomes less and less available for further injections. So I'm actually gonna conclude here with the following statements. Um, one, upright postural intolerance is an important component of intracranial hypertension, but also other diseases and yet less well recognized and not quantified. Contribution of positional changes in cerebral venous drainage and variations between individuals in upright posture intolerance requires further study. Quantitative assessment of various components of upright posture intolerance is important. I think we need long-term studies to understand the therapeutic effect of epidural blood patches or interventions in patients with carry malformations and whether a relative period of stability can be achieved with repeated injections. And cervical epidural blood patches may be valuable in patients who have refractory syndromes, but I think patient selection criteria still need to be defined. Well, thank you. Any questions for Dr. Qureshi? Would it be true to say that the jugular flow, that the jugular veins conduct most of the flow when you are supine, <coughs> and that the perivertebral plexus and the other veins often conduct most of the flow when you are upright? So that is actually um, um, something that um, uh, our group and other groups have shown that there's clearly a change in the role of the internal jugular vein in different positions. And in the upright position, as more blood is actually drained into these paravertebral venous plexus, which actually have high resistance, so perhaps more controlled drainage in upright posture is kind of maintained because of that. Now the question is that why do the internal jugular veins stop functioning, or you know the function becomes less? Are there valves in these uh, uh, veins that we don't know for sure? Are there any external compressions on the muscles that are changing the pattern of flow? So while I think that there is more proof that there is a change in the pattern of flow, but what actually prompts this change in pattern is unless uh, it's not really fine well. Yeah, we certainly see, and I'm sure you've seen 10 times more, a lot of compression of the jugulars by the posterior belly of the digastric, the stellar hyoid ligament, and the lateral mass of the C1. And there may be some postural effect on the jugular vein in the upright position, I don't know. I think that's definitely a possibility. Um, I think that more studies would be required that uh, perhaps it's actually the pair of a table muscles or it's actually the epidural, the processes of the spinous process that are changing the direction of flow. Uh, but it's actually uh, uh, an interesting phenomenon. And then uh, when we're talking about cerebral venous insufficiency and we're just using an angiogram or an MR angiogram to I'm a venogram to define it, perhaps we're not even looking at the right thing. Okay. Dr. Gilbert. So uh, that was a great talk, by the way. Um, I noticed that in the PRA patient with Marfan's, um, the pre-op MRI didn't show some of the signs that you might see 
the sagging of the optic tract, the sagging of the corpuscle, um, the intracranial hypotension. So, in your patients that you find with this, do they typically have those findings, or do you have some patients who really have a CSF when you don't have any of those findings? So this is a, a very good question about MRI findings in intracranial hypertension and how do they uh, guide mm -hmm. um, epidural uh, injections. And um, there is two separate views. I, mean, I think that there is a puristic view, and a lot of people do that, that they would not use epidural intervention in a patient who does not have the classic signs on the MRI. So there's consular descent, compression of the ventricle, and perhaps enhancement uh, around the brain. Uh, and then there are certain people who actually say that the clinical manifestation, and if there is a clear postural component, um, that probably is enough for them to warrant an epidural intervention. Now, one thing that we didn't discuss is that you know we always talk about low volume, low stimulus pool volume as the reason for intracranial hypertension, but there is more. Oh, sorry, my voice was But there is actually another component, uh, compliance. And more and more people are actually advocating for compliance. So it is not the amount of volume of cerebrospinal fluid, but actually the compliance of the dura that may also determine what the pressure is. So if the dura is, let's say, uh, more dehiscent, uh, more likely to bulge out, obviously the same volume will not generate the same amount of pressure and may actually mimic low pressure. And essentially, so that's another reason that people are trying to figure out how to do these compliance studies. Uh, we have done some, basically, you actually get the patient, you put a lumbar catheter, you inject lactate ringles, and you actually look at the pressure at various volumes. But we don't know what the normative values are. So they can clearly have a pressure curve. You can actually see increasing in pressure as you're injecting more volume. But we don't know what the normal value is, so we can't really tell whether there is a greater compliance of the dura and essentially what we will call as a normal volume, low pressure syndrome. Dr. Jackson, so Glad there is interest because that's one of the things I was going to hit on my talk. But one question I had for you though was the pressure monitoring with a lumbar catheter. Simple question: Where are you zeroing it? Because obviously that makes a huge difference in terms of is it 40 when he's standing up because you're zeroing at his back, and that's just a gravity effect. I knew this was ever come, <laughs> but uh, we actually adjusted the zero values. Um, so we actually kept changing it to the level of the heart. So we would actually make the monitor go off. So, because you're absolutely right. Depending on the heart, though, <laughs> yeah. the, where's the catheter actually measuring it? So, if the catheter is. So, that's a very good question. Uh, so, the catheter. I, I, I don't know what the right answer is, but that's always when it's reported yeah. from a lumbar. I never know how to interpret what the, what the numbers mean when they're not just completely. Even I when they I, are flat. No. I think you bring an excellent question. Where should the zero be? I mean, obviously, it can't be at the same level when they're lying in the supine. Uh, but when they go upright, how high should it be? Should it go all the way to the internal jugular vein as our zero measure? Should it go to the level of the heart? And I think that we don't know. So I think that uh, you are correct that as we interpret the absolute values, we have to be careful. Uh, but I think the trend clearly, one would have to agree that clearly there is a change in pressure and it's definitely towards the higher end. I volunteer. Dr. Jackson is a normal volunteer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you bring you a microphone. No, so, you get, so you get normative values. I, I volunteer Dr. Jackson. I don't know that, normal I don't know that I'm normal. <laughs> <laughs> I think that we do need some normal volunteers. I'm glad there are some in the room that are ready to step up. <laughs> okay, thank you, Dr. Curtis. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs>